Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Muswell Hill Methodist Church, a service of celebration and thanksgiving for Jenny and David Ristarik. Before we begin, just some notices. Uh, toilets are through the double doors and you turn left, and the fire exits are just this door here. If in doubt, follow me. <laughs> this is a service of celebration and thanksgiving for the wonderful David and for Jenny Ristarik. We're going to bring the family in now and I invite you please, if you're able, to please stand. The music finished quicker than I thought. <laughs> welcome. I welcome you all and thank you all for being here as we come to celebrate the life of David and Jenny. We have been at the crematorium and we have gathered together and commended and committed them to God in a quiet and peaceful way as they lived so much together in life. In death they went together and it was a quiet time of just commending them to God but to, now we gather to remember and to celebrate all that they have me meant to us all and one of the joys is to just look at that photograph on there and to see those smiles and to feel the joy of life that they had that they shared with every one of us and we hold on to that as we celebrate that life together so i invite you to join as we celebrate to stand and to sing our first hymn "O oh lord my god <laughs>
and let us pray together. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, in his great mercy by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, he gave us new birth into a living hope, the hope of an inheritance reserved in heaven for us all, which nothing can destroy or spoil or wither. O oh, almighty God, we gather as we thank you for your love, which from the moment of creation has enveloped us in the assurance that through all things you are in the midst. As we come on this occasion of celebrating the lives of ones who have touched our lives, we come in praise to you. We come thankful for David and Jenny. We thank you for the opportunities that we have had in life to share life with them. We thank you for the joy of life that they brought to so many. We thank you that we can stand in the assurance of your love that welcomes them both into your kingdom and holds them tight in your love now as we gather to share our memories, as we gather to find strength in our morning, as we gather to be assured that God holds all things. So we come in praise to you. We come in worship. We come in thankfulness. And we pray that as we share together, your Holy Spirit would assure us of a presence of a God who has conquered all things, who has conquered death, and walks with us now in life. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'm going to share some words from Psalm 139, verses 1 and then 13 to 18. O Lord, you have searched me, and you know me. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you. When I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my uniform body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God! How vast is the sum of them! Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. When I awake, I am still with you. Thanks be to God for his word. We continue to hear some words of scripture and Fran is going to read to us from 2 Timothy. This is 2 Timothy, chapter 4, verses 1 to 8. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. But you, keep your head in all situations. Endure hardship. Do the work of an evangelist. Discharge all the duties of your ministry. For I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time has come for my departure. 
I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. Amen. Thank you, Pam. And invite Matthew, if he'll come and share. Afternoon, everyone. I would just like to start by offering from all of the family to all of you here, thanks for coming. Remembrance is an incredibly personal thing. We all have our own little places which we, little pieces, sorry, which we carry around with us and keep close to our hearts. These little pieces will be a unique selection of moments and memories gift, gifted to us by the time we spent together. Remembrance is a sign that we have lost something of significance, something we wish to get back. Our Christian values teach us that love is our single greatest power. It will reach everything and everyone. So as we gather here today at Muswell Hill Methodist Church, let us all unite all our little pieces. Let us love and celebrate the lives of Jenny and David, or as I will be referring to them, sorry, Grandma and Granddad, the celebration is nothing without memories. We will hear many throughout this service, each from a different perspective. But there are only two people in this, this world that had the privilege to call them their grandparents, and that was my sister and me. Our journey would always start at Valley Avenue, a very peaceful place where there would be many hours of laughter and enjoyment. This would extend not just to family, but to guests and friends alike. Grandad would either be at his desk, on the computer, or reading a timetable along with the newspaper. Grandma would be wandering about, gardening or reading, and if you were very lucky, supplying Kit Kats. Grandma and I would spend hours drawing and painting. The colours would stretch from the garden to our paper. Emma would spend time practicing music and talking about classical move, movements and composers. In our early years, they were, there were reruns of Wallace and Gromit, Legos sliding around the wooden floor and long cozy evenings with card games. We will notice that the rules of the games were changed slightly, depending on who was winning. But inevitably would be ruined by Grandad's inability to keep a serious face when he knew, we knew, he was messing around with us. <laughs> Grandma was always seemingly surprised by this move before we all would descend into laughter. Creative thinking was an attribute of both Grandma and Grandad. Grandad in his writing for the church, and if you were very unlucky, a heated conversation on the current political agenda. Grandma's musical genes were passed down to Emma and Grandma being able to help with Emma's musical exams. They could often be found singing scales and replaying small pieces of music on Grandma's piano and collection of recorders. This would move on to Emma and two of them spending time visiting classical concerts and performances. For myself, my connection with Grandma would be through our art. This would be our creative outlets with the one condition, I wasn't allowed to throw anything away that I had attempted. For art, for art is an exploration and not a perfection. These are two elements that remain a huge part of Emma and my lives today, and we are greatly thankful for the time we had with them, exploring and developing these passions. There was always an outing with Grandma and Grandad. I will always remember them wanting to give Emma and I experiences we could look back on. There were frequent picnics, and in particular the Dunstable Downs before an afternoon walk. 
Another childhood favourite was the model villages, model worlds of miniature accuracy and, of course, miniature railways. There was a time when I wasn't so confident and school was a struggle. And I was a figure of frustration. Gwenda used this to help in the only way I think he knew how. An extremely detailed trip around London, using almost every method of transportation. Timetable in hand, we would set out Finchley to Clapham to Wembley to Battersea. He would quiz me on the line colours, bus stops, cycleways and train operators. It was his way of teaching me of how to cope in this world, or at least the knowledge of how to navigate the city. This, was amazingly, this would later amazingly frustrate him when I started to drive, <laughs> as he didn't understand why I used the sat-nav, despite the roots from his memory and the machine being virtually identical. But above all, this was a rehearsal for probably the greatest train journey, I think, I have ever embarked on, and one he loved to do too. A small town in Switzerland would become their home from home, starting at a near loca nearby location for their honeymoon to an annual travel destination. They shared it as a couple, with friends, and with the family. They enjoyed years of scenic bliss and the European way of life. A hotel and later a B&B dominate the photographs and you can see it was a truly meaningful place. Along the way, they developed great friendships which lasted all these years and which have extended to the wider family. There will always be a part of them there. We have had the privilege of taking them back, which would have been their final time in 2019 and it was worth every second. These are just a few highlights memories from Emma and me, and we will miss them greatly. Grandad often told me I found the right words. This was often a little confusing to me. And I am, so the following prayer, I hope is just a reflection of what he meant. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, teach us that death is not the end, for it is a simple passing from our world into yours. Remind us our Christian values, never enjoy in love, shall expand to all, both in life and death. Hear us as we gather in your house of worship. Strengthen us on the days when we wish we won. Comfort us in the times when we will miss them the most and refresh us with their memory. Promise us as we pass them into your internal care that you will love and care for them as they did us. Calm all worries and numb all pains. Grant us, us, grant us all these wishes. We ask this in your name. Amen. Thank you so much, Mark. and Emma, for sharing your grandparents with us. And that faith that Matthew mentioned. Let us stand and sing, Oh Jesus, I have promised.
continue in our remembrances as we hear, and we are hearing about two lives today. I just say that so you're aware that we're taking two lives. And we invite Jill to come and share as a friend. I first met Jenny when she joined the staff at Edgeware Infant School in the early 80s. I was the deputy head teacher, and Daisy Mackay, who some of you may remember, was the recently appointed head teacher. The school was, was witnessing a major change in its demographics. Many of the children joining the school were from countries far across the world. Many new languages and cultures were experienced in the school. For many children, English was a completely unknown language. For the first time in their young lives, they were in an English-speaking environment, in an unfamiliar country, and experiencing school for the first time. Difficult to imagine, but very daunting. <coughs> Jenny's role was to work with these children for whom English was not their first language. Jenny would provide the support for these children in any way she could. Jenny settled into her new role with great enthusiasm, as she had for everything, and not only supported and taught the children, but by her fantastic example, was educating the whole of the school staff as to the best way we could support and help them to learn and to thrive. She searched all over London for suitable resources, scouring education catalogues, libraries, bookshops, and a range of ethnically diverse shops for suitable equipment and resources. She wanted the children to see books that showed illustrations of people who represented them and familiar objects that they were, and objects they were familiar with from their own cultures. And all this was way before Amazon, so it was a major task. With support from the parents, the children, supported by Jenny, wrote and adapted simple stories, the children illustrating the books, and the parents using their home languages to write the story alongside the English text. As the 80s moved on and the national curriculum was introduced into all schools in England, Jenny worked with the school staff, encouraging and ensuring that whenever possible, children for whom English was not their first language could access the new curriculum. She used her many skills and strengths, art, music, craft, and the natural world to modify the materials that were available. One of Jenny's great strengths was her planning, something we all learned from. Jenny would arrive at school with all her paperwork ready, everything ready for the children, and the rest of us, come nine o'clock, would still be scratching around, trying to get the guest Etna, if any of you remember those, <laughs> to produce the work we wanted. Jenny's was always ready. To help the children with their acquisition of, of English, Jenny produced amazing big books, as we call them, large A1 sheets of card, retelling again simple stories. The children always played a very active role in producing these books. Much of the teaching support that Jenny produced and used was interactive, with the children all being encouraged to take part and to have a very active role. Puppets were another tool that Jenny used to effectively teach and encourage children to take part in the activities. Jenny was someone who supported, whose support was valued by all members of staff. I was fortunate enough to be acting head teacher of Edgware Infant School for a year, and Jenny was my first choice to be acting deputy head. At first, she was very reluctant, as she was only working part-time and the job would have been full-time, but eventually she agreed to take on the role. We had a very challenging time. On more than one occasion, our judgment was questioned. 
but Jenny was always there, ensuring that whatever was said, it was for the children's good. Never mind any adults that thought they knew better. The core of everything that Jenny did was to pro provide the best education outcomes for all of the children. But as the years went by, Jenny was called upon for her expertise to be shared by the local education authority. And the knowledge and experience that she had was shared with teaching and non-teaching staff across Barnet and beyond. Thank you, Jenny for the many teaching staff you inspired and thousands of children who benefited from your wonderful example, expertise and enthusiasm for giving all children the best start in life that could be provided. Finally, thank you Jenny and David for 40 years of friendship, for the shared experiences, fun, laughter and for knowing you both and sharing your life's experiences. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jill, as we can picture Jenny now with you. And now I'm gonna invite David as a local preacher, a fellow local preacher of David. The uh, phone rang and I answered it. David Ristarik here. <laughs> and the voice said, I thought I ought to let you know that my wife's knickers have been trapped in the stairlift. I'm sure I could hear Jenny in the background shouting out, I wasn't in them at the time. <laughs> and the next day, which happened to be Victory in Europe Day, the phone rang again. <coughs> David Ristarik here. Just to let you know that my wife's knickers have been liberated. <laughs> Some people would say that to be a Methodist local preacher, these days you need a sense of humour. David not only needed a sense of humour, but a wife in Jenny who supported him every step of the way. Jenny was there to listen to every new controversial thought at his rose. She was there to push him out of the door on those days which come for every preacher when they don't want to go. She was there to drive David to countless appointments as he got older. She was there to keep him grounded. When another great thought emerged, I remember Jenny telling him, don't forget you came bottom in the divinity class. <laughs> And of course, she was normally there in the congregation with her wonderful singing voice, which contrasted rather to David's voice, which perhaps wasn't quite so good. But it was David who did the preaching. For 75 years, including his training years. And for nearly 50 of those years, I looked up to David Ristarik. In many ways, but not least when looking at the list of preachers on the back of the plan, where they give the dates when each preacher started to preach. There always immediately above me was David Ristarik, qualified as a preacher 
in 1951, the year I was born. And we used to tease each other that we had an unbroken preaching partnership of some 120 years. And that John Sims celebrating his 40 years was but a youngster. <laughs> Yet there was no doubt who was the senior partner. Not only in age, but in everything else. If I got above myself, he would say, I remember you in short trousers. <laughs> and today we can thank God for 75 years of David's preaching. Years in which, above all, in the words of great Christians before him, he helped us to see Jesus. And there is no greater tribute that I or anyone else can make than he helped us to see Jesus. He first heard the call when he was 19, a member of the Middle Lane Methodist Church. And he had been inspired at an interdenominational conference where he met a number of young people who, in his words, were on fire with God. He heard the call clearly and it stayed with him for the rest of his life. I would not want to compare him in too many ways with the prophet Jeremiah, but he heard the call like the great prophet. In his own way, God said to David like he did to Jeremiah, you shall go to whatever people I send you and say whatever I tell you to say and I will put words into your mouth. And for 75 years, he did just that. He went wherever the church sent him and preached the love of God to all who would hear. He went to the pack congregations and to the two or three. It didn't matter. He went whether that Sunday he wanted to or not. He went sometimes after hours of struggle when the world's words wouldn't come easily. He went when the uncertainties crept in and the words first said to John Wesley inspired him, preach faith until you have it. And he did it in the way that St Paul commanded Timothy to preach in the reading Fran read to us. Paul wrote to Timothy as though he could have been writing to David Ristarik. I command you to preach God's message. Tick. Do it willingly. Tick. Do even do it even if it isn't an if, even if it isn't a popular thing to do, most certainly tick. Correct people and point out their sins, tick. Cheer them up, tick. You must work hard, tick. You must tell them the good news. You must do your job well, tick. And you must do it all with patience. Well, I'm not so sure about that one. <laughs> I was always taught that preaching is about comforting the afflicted and afflicting the comfortable. And he did that in equal measure. In comforting the afflicted, he preached the salvation which can be found in our Lord Jesus Christ. He preached like St Paul before him that there is nothing in all creation that can separate us from the love of God. He preached about his friend and his saviour Jesus Christ and offered him to others. But he afflicted the comfortable. 
he raised the most important moral, political and social issues of the day and challenged us to respond. He fought the corner of the poor and the marginalised. He afflicted the comfortable by challenging us all not to be too comfortable in our own denominations, but to work ecumenically to further the kingdom. On our last visit to see David, when nearly all words and movement had been taken away from him, I was standing by the bed when he very, very slowly raised his arm from under the blanket and very deliberately took hold of my hand. And there we were, the two old preachers, holding hands, united in the love of God, united in the knowledge that Christ had died for both of us. I thank God that David had challenged me and countless others to, th to think de seriously about our faith, even when it was uncomfortable to do so. And I was inspired that I was with someone who had meant it when he sang, O oh Jesus, I have promised to serve thee to the end. We didn't have to say it, but we knew that the commission to preach was about to be taken away. His captain, his captain was about to appear on the pavilion balcony to wave him in, to declare his innings, undefeated on 75 years not out. But wonderfully, no sooner had he walked into the pavilion, his bat held high, and the applause began to ab abate, that Jenny appeared. And I can only imagine what he said. Thank God you've come. I've given my dates for the next quarter. <laughs> I should have a good congregation up here. Bless you, thank you. As we reflect on those pictures of David given, and Jenny given to us, I invite Asra to read from the Gospel. So this lesson is taken from the Gospel of John, chapter 12, verses 20 to 26. Jesus predicts his death. Now there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the feast. They came to Philip, who was from Bethesda in Galilee, with a request. Sir they said, we would like to see Jesus. Philip went to tell Andrew. Andrew and Philip in turn told Jesus. Then Jesus replied, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. I tell you the truth, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. The man who loves his life will lose it, while the man who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be. 
My Father will honour the one who serves me. Amen. Thank you, Asa. Invite Fran on behalf of her and they to come and speak. Just to say, I'm here on behalf of both my husband and myself. Um, my husband, having just come out of hospital, having had major heart surgery, isn't able to be here today. But this is from both of us. But first of all, thank you, Anna, for inviting us to share in this service today. Dear Jenny and David, we just wanted to say thank you for all that your friendship has meant to us over the years. It's amazing to think that that friendship began back in 1970, when you kindly offered hospitality to my David, who was moving to London for his first job after finishing university. Through mutual friends, David was introduced to you both, and you opened your home to him for a few weeks, whilst you found somewhere more permanent to live. David so enjoyed living with you that it took two and a half years <laughs> before he eventually moved out. You were most patient, although I know Jenny enjoyed flat hunting, flat hunting with him, and in fact was once mistaken for his wife, which she thought was hilarious. <laughs> you both gave David a wonderful home, and also introduced him to Muswell Hill Methodist Church, so for that he thanks you. As a couple, David and I are very grateful for all the love and support you gave to us. I actually still remember the experience of eating homemade gazpacho soup at one of my first meals at your home. And I have never found another one that has tasted so good. Maybe it was the actual soup, or maybe it was the feeling of being made so welcome that made it so special. When David and I got married, it seemed an obvious choice to have Anna as one of our bridesmaids. Although apologies for the choice of bridesmaids dress, Anna, but it was 1981. <laughs> Many years later, when Anna and John celebrated their big day, our eldest daughter, Hannah, was a bridesmaid. And it was a privilege to share in such a big day with all of you. We were very grateful to you, Jenny, for happily coming to look after Hannah when I went into labour with Ed. It says a lot that Hannah wasn't at all surprised to see you in the morning and just greeted you with, oh, hello, Jenny. No questions about where the parents were. As a growing family, we spent many happy times with you. Hannah, Ed and Beth fondly remember playing with the gravel in the back garden, just simply pouring one pot of stones into another, or croquet on the lawn and Ed had his first taste of mature cheddar one tea time. You, David, were so patient with them when playing backgammon and attempting to teach them your special language, Arp and Drop. Ed loved the carpet in your sitting room so much that he'd usually fall asleep behind the sofa, usually about nine o'clock, so we all knew it was definitely time to go home. Now two of those children have children of their own, and it was so good that despite COVID and all the difficulties that entailed, you could briefly meet the next generation and be kept up to date via photos and videos of their exploits. But you were also there for the difficult times in our lives, especially during the year that Olivia was part of our family. You supported us all both practically and emotionally. Remember that day, Jenny, when you turned up at our house? I was at the hospital with Olivia, Pam was looking after Hannah and Ed, so you just got on with the ironing. Thank you for those moments. When we think back over these years, it is with great thankfulness and much love. You both maintained friendships with your contemporaries for as long as you were able. We feel privileged that we could share so much with you, such a lot of laughter and fun, that serious discussions and debates, even in that last difficult year. It was hard for us all to see the changes in you both, but even in those final weeks, there was still the essence of you both present, still the witty riposte from you, David, and that slightly cheeky smile from you, Jenny. We will miss you both so much. <coughs> Lots of love, David, Fran and family. As we've heard so much, I'm going to invite John to introduce some photos. Are you going to introduce the photographs?
So before I introduce our visual tribute, um, Anna and I would like to thank you all very much for coming to celebrate Jenny and David's life and of course invite you to stay, join us for lunch after the service and a chat in the garden room. We know some of you have travelled very long distance to be with us today and there are many others with us in thought and online. It's much appreciated. <coughs> Jenny and David valued their family and friends. Everyone here at Muswell Hill Church and the wider circuit were particularly special to them and you've played a massive part in their lives. This has been more than evident to Anna and myself, particularly over the last couple of years when Jenny and David's health was declining. We've already heard many lovely and fitting tributes in celebration of David and Jenny, and there are more to come. These are truly inspirational, describing their lives of committed service to their work, faith, wider church and their family, but significantly to each other. I've had the privilege of getting to know Jenny and David over many years, going back to before even Anna and I were married, when David and Jenny spent time at Manor Drive Church. But as son-in-law, I, I become part of many situations that others don't see and I'd like to share just a couple of memories from those times past. They are lightly or slightly lighter hearted moments even though that may not how it seemed at the time. Amongst David's many qualities he had certain impulsive traits that were demonstrated from time to time. This led to one situation that I will always remember. One day, Anna and I popped down to see Jenny and David, and as we drove up Valley Avenue, um, we noticed there was a new car parked on the drive. Look, Anna said, Mum and Dad have changed their car. Now, I think that might have been followed by the word again, but I'm not, <laughs> I'm not sure. Anyway, it certainly looked really clean, sparkly, there were no dents and scratches. So, mm, very pleasant. So as I walked in, of course, I said to David, mm, new car looks really good. I said, um, if I were you, I would get that in the garage pretty quickly, just to make sure it doesn't get dirty. Ah, he replied, the slight problem is it's too big to go in the garage. <laughs> <laughs> it was a good deal on the forecourt that I didn't want to miss, uh, but I didn't think to check the size before I agreed to buy it. <laughs> Jenny, on the other hand, was one who always was extremely well prepared, so things she did always ran smoothly. This was certainly the case for many house parties that Jenny and David held and organised at Valley Avenue and many of us here enjoyed. It wasn't confirmed in fact until a conversation I had with Jenny earlier this year and in fact has been confirmed a second time by Jill in um, her review just earlier. I was talking to Jenny about her teaching career and she said she always felt it was so important to be well prepared for lessons to ensure the best outcome for the children. Um, she spent extra time getting ready, as Jill indicated, and therefore mitigating many of the risks that could crop up in the classroom. Of course, best made plans and all that, life sometimes gets in the way, and one day it did for Jenny. Um, we'd all gone down for an evening meal, 
and Jenny had prepared stew and dumplings. I hadn't had dumplings for years and was looking forward to a good old hearty meal. So Jenny served dinner. I took my first bite and got a nasty surprise. It tasted awful. <laughs> I grabbed a drink, looked at Anna, Emma and Matt, and it was clear that we were all thinking the same thing. I had to admit, I chickened out and left it to Anna to point out to Jenny. And of course, Jenny was naturally concerned, but did agree it tasted a bit odd. Following investigation, Jenny discovered the suet she pulled from the back of the cupboard for the dumplings was many years out of date. <laughs> I cannot report how many because that's classified. <laughs> but, the, but the taste certainly confirmed it was slightly aged. <laughs> so for many meals um, following, it became a standing joke at uh, Valley Avenue to ask, um, have the used by dates been checked, Jenny? <laughs> so anyway, moving on. When thinking about today and Anna and my contribution to this celebration and how we could share more about Jenny and David, we thought it would be fitting if we did something visual. Um, we have literally thousands of photographs in our collection and many from Jenny and David's too. So Anna has been through them over the last few weeks and selected a set for us to see today. So based on the saying, a picture is worth a thousand words, the next seven minutes contains the equivalent of about 85,000 words. <laughs> and according to a random website, that's about the length of Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets, <laughs> if you need a benchmark. We hope all of you are truly able to relate to some of these images in the video, and they trigger your own personal memories of Jenny and David, and all the splendid times we've been able to share together. Please take time to reflect. Both of us have as we've created this video. Therefore, it just leaves me to call the famous Q line, Roll VT.
Thank you so much for giving us that wonderful journey through the life of David and Jenny. Let's indeed declare their faithfulness to us as we stand and sing, Great is thy faithfulness. <laughs> Please be seated. When we began to uh, plan for uh, the service for David, we chose the readings and the hymns uh, as, as three ministers who've been involved uh, with David and Jenny these last uh, years. We planned it with Anna uh, and John and we were ready to share that service, but we were aware that Jenny had not um, recovered from the coma. In fact, she never knew that David had died. And it was at the request of, of Anna and John that we just waited a little while because there was a, a deep awareness that Jenny would soon be joining David in God's kingdom. And so the, the readings were chosen to reflect David's life. And yet, as we have listened today to stories about both of them, they actually reflect both their lives. And to thank those who have spoken already, you've not left me anything to say, and, but to thank you because all the things have been interwoven. And as David said, that both Jenny and David indeed 
helped us see who Jesus was. And when those uh, Greeks come to firstly Philip and then Philip goes to Andrew and Andrew takes them to see Jesus, Jesus' words at that moment, because it is the turning point in the life and ministry of Jesus, he says, now the time has come to glorify my Father. And then when I saw the, the programme, uh, I saw that this is called a eulogy. Uh, majority of funerals that um, I take, uh, a eulogy lasts for a long, long time, and it outlines a whole of the life of the person who has died. But I'm not going to share that with you. I'm going to just share one or two things around that understanding of honouring God, of glorifying God. Jenny, she was born here in London. Her parents uh, kept moving an awful lot because they couldn't pay the rent or something, I think Anna said. But she went to Hornsey High School for Girls. And then she went to Brighton to train as a teacher. And we've just heard a wonderful eulogy of what a great teacher she was. And at the school where she was deputy head, her two grandchildren went to the same school. How things come in circles. Reverend Matt might be interested to know that actually David wasn't only a member at Middle Lane and Muswell Hill, but also at Holly Park. He was baptised at Holly Park by his granddad, the Reverend Mustarik, who was a missionary in Sri Lanka and who died in Sri Lanka. And we have a minister here in this circuit from Sri Lanka at the moment. David uh, went to school. The problem is that David wrote down his whole life story. But David went to school um, in, in a house in Park Avenue North. And this is what he says. The pupils sat round the large dining room table. The worst part was the family Dalmatian who always sat under the table and found legs were good to bite every now and again. He then moved schools and, and then the war came and David ended up in Eastbourne with his, his parents. And then the evacuation came and they had to move. And they went to Hillsdon. He, he, he met a doctor called Don, Dr. Andrew Pearson. Most of you probably have never heard of him, but I have. And he is a legend within the life of the Methodist Church because of the work he did in Nigeria at the hospital there. And this is what he wrote. He said, I met Dr. Andrew Pearson, who worked at the local hospital. We became friends, and he would invite me to his room at the hospital. And sometimes he would say, come on, let's pray together. And we would kneel by his bed. That was the beginning of a life-changing experience that David Bedford has shared with us. And just as we've heard about Jenny's work, her long commitment to education, David started working at, at Spillers. He, as um, was indicated by David, he candidated for the ministry, but he got the lowest marks in the whole of the connection for the doctrine exams, and I think therefore didn't go down that route. But he went to Selly Oak, where he trained as a social worker. And he had a number of jobs before he worked for over 30 years for insurance. And then he ended up working for the British Council of Churches. And then right at the end, he worked for Christian Aid. So here are two people, Jenny and David, 
who sought through their lives to glorify God. After the war, he'd just begun work David had and uh, he was called up. But he believed in peace. And so he said he would become a conscientious uh, objector. And he had to go before whatever he went before, the army tribunal. And he says that they accepted his objection on condition he worked as a hospital porter. And I think David and Jenny's life is summed up in the way that they sought to serve people. This was the hallmark of the stories and the testimony that we've heard here today. Jenny honoured God through all that she did. We've heard about her love of singing and she was part of uh, a choral society, Elysian. She had singing lessons herself when she was young. And think of the garden, that's the picture that's there during the whole service. Her creativity, her painting that she passed on to you, Matthew. I hope you haven't thrown any of them away. And John 12 says, in that story that we heard, that if we are willing to die to ourself, we will bear much fruit. And Jenny, through all her creativity, David, through his preaching and teaching and his love of transport and trains, they bore much fruit. And they have honoured God. But not only have they honoured God, they honoured each other. Let me read some words to you. Will you, David, Jenny, comfort and honour one another? Be your companions to all the joys and sorrows of life. And be faithful to one another as long as you both shall live. That is part of the marriage vow that they made all those years ago. And what does it say? Will you comfort and honour? The wedding service has changed. I know these words were not the words that David and Jenny said. But nowadays, as we, rings are exchanged, the bride will say to the groom and the groom will say to the bride, with my body, I honour you. And if David and Jenny honoured God, they honoured one another. So David had heard about the 20 plus club here at Muswell Hill. And he was a young man, and so he knew that there'd be women at this 20-plus <laughs> club. And so he transferred here from Middle Lane. And in, he got involved in the Sunday school, and as he told in his own writings, you had to go to preparation class every Friday. And if you didn't come to preparation class, you were not allowed to teach in the Sunday school. But let me remind you in his words, these were the days when there were nearly 500 children in the Muswell Hill Methodist Sunday School. Half of them met at Coldfall School. But he says this. He says, It was there I met my future wife playing footsie under the table. <laughs> and then they were married in the old church and we, we saw pictures of that happy occasion. And he says, and after the wedding reception in the, gar um, in the, the garden room, and then they drove off back to their first um, uh, place 
And uh, on, then by Greenland for the first night of married bliss at the Trust House near Box Hill. And then they went on their honeymoon to Switzerland. And that's where they both fell in love with Switzerland. And just before we came in, I was just assuming that they went to Switzerland because they love skiing. And both Emma and Matthew just laughed and said, the thought of granddad skiing. <laughs> but they honoured one another through their marriage. They moved to a flat in Crouch Hill above the shops and they say how when they were having their tea they could see some of the people on the, the 212 bus coming to Muswell Hill Church. And they moved to Friary Close and then to Valley Avenue. And at each time they loved one another and Anna was born and Anna was the apple of your dad's eye. I'm sure your mum loved you as well. <laughs> but both of them were members of the MAYC and part of a group that is I think is still meeting, as I was middle lane a few weeks ago, this conversation was held over coffee, of how this group still try to keep in touch with each other. When we were together the other day, we were talking about mum and dad, and of how they complemented each other. Let me just read some of the the, the words that, um, sorry Emma you weren't there, but words that uh, Matthew and Anna and John said about David. He's challenging, he's gentle, he's got a naughty sense of humour, he's kind, he's controversial, he's loving, he's impulsive, a thirst for knowledge, he's thoughtful, he's impatient, he's friendly, he's provocative, not afraid to speak his mind, he's caring, he's generous, desperately wants to keep up with modern technology and very frustrated when he couldn't. How many 93-year-olds can shop online? <laughs> but hold those words with these words of Jenny and just see how they complement each other. Mum, Grandma, difficult to know what she was really thinking. Certainly not controversial. Thankful, helpful, grateful, friendly, couldn't cut dumplings. Sorry, no, that one wasn't there. <laughs> kind, considerate, caring, creative, supportive, patient, strict at times, tidy, organised, politically correct, creative, determined, stubborn. These are words of the most intimate members of the family. And we give God thanks that they not only honoured God, they honoured one another. And they had a good sense of humour. And in the home there was always laughter and love. And they honoured each other through the family and friends. And there were three particular couples who cared for one another and enjoyed being with each other. And I know at least one of those couples is online. But Bob and Mary, George and Jean, David and Jenny, spent years and years together, particularly on holidays and fun times. But if they honoured God, and if they honoured one another, today we are here to acknowledge that they are being honoured by God.
This is what Jesus said. The end of those six verses that we heard read from John 12. And my Father will honour anyone who serves me. Anna, John, Emma, Matthew. I want you to be proud in the best possible way that your dad, your mum, your grandparents are being honoured by God because they honoured God and they honoured one another in the faithfulness and love of their marriage, of their family life, in their friendships with us. Yes, they honoured God in very different ways, but God honours them and God honours their faithfulness. Both of them had a heart that other people might come to know the same Jesus that they knew. As Matt said at the crematorium, they had a deep concern for the future of this church and the church generally. But they were committed. They were faithful. And so I read the last verse from 2 Timothy chapter 4. And now, think of mum and dad, and now there is waiting for me the victory prize of being put right with God, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give David and Jenny on that day. And not only to them, but to all who will love him. And so today, yes, there is a certificate here for 70 years of preaching. There was a certificate on the screen for all those years of teaching in Barnet. But the greatest reward is to know that they today are honoured by God. Thank you. After hearing those words, we come to a prayer of thanksgiving. Let us pray. Gracious God, we praise you for creating us in your image and calling each one of us to love and to serve you. We thank you for David and Jenny and for all we treasure and remember with gratitude about them. As memories fill our minds, and we thank you for the gift of memories. We give thanks for Jenny and David, whom we remember today for all the ways in which their lives have touched ours, for the difficult as well as the good times, for the ways in which their lives and their love continue to be with us and on our hearts, in our sadness and with thanksgiving, we will remember them. Living God, give us the strength and courage to leave Jenny and David in your keeping, trusting in your everlasting goodness. Almighty God, we rejoice in your promise of love, joy and peace. In your mercy, turn the darkness of death into the dawn of new life. The sorrow of parting into the joy of heaven. Through our Saviour, Jesus Christ, who died, rose again, lives forevermore, so that one day we will see 
our loved ones again. Lord, for those gifts of memories, we give you thanks. Amen. As we heard earlier on, the words are shared of love and faith. And now Anna's going to share about love. What is love? Real love is kind. It means being able to commit, cherish, honour, respect, love and care. It brings great joy to people's lives. It is not about the money or being rich. It is about being rich at heart, being together through thick and thin. Share memories and keep it real. No matter how tough it is, love brings out the best in each other. It has no limits. It is about being able to give and not want in return. Love cannot be seen nor touched. You cannot deny it, but it can be felt. And in the assurance of that love, we stand and sing, Blessed Assurance. and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit remain with us always. Amen. Amen. Amen.
Thank you. 